Dr. Robert Price teaches philosophy and religion at the Johnny Coleman Theological Seminary. He has a Ph.D. in systematic theology and a second Ph.D. in the New Testament. A published author and recognized expert in the history of Christianity, biblical criticism, and theology, Dr. Price has also written books on the historicity of Jesus and the various Christ myth theories. He has served as a fellow of the Jesus Seminar, the former editor of the Journal of Higher Criticism, a fellow for the Center for Inquiry's Committee on the Scientific Examination of Religion, and the advisory board of the Secular Student Alliance. He graciously agreed to sit down with us to discuss the historicity of Jesus and how or if this topic has relevance in debates and discussions with Christians. In debates with theists, uh, we often cover questions pertaining to the existence of God, and I'm often asked about my position on the historicity of Jesus, mm -hmm. and there are many people who are engaged in having conversations about this topic, whether or not they have any relevant expertise or any mm -hmm. studying, and I thought we'd take some time to get your thoughts, mm -hmm. and I know you spoke about this yesterday, so kind of briefly, what is your position on this question of the historicity of Jesus? Well, I think we, uh, as with the present state of evidence, I don't see how anybody could be confident they know one way or the other. And I'm kind of surprised, though uh, in another sense not, to hear mainstream uh, academics say that, oh yeah, yeah, we know uh, Jesus existed, he was a teacher, he was crucified. People said they saw him raised from the dead. I, uh, I don't think we know even that uh, for sure. And uh, uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, I think it would be absurd and cultic and fanatical for me to say, oh yeah, Jesus didn't exist, there's no way he did, that would be absurd. And in fact, I always say that if somebody could just come up with an ancient letter from a papyrus heap, and many have been found, where some uh, traveling businessman wrote home to his wife and said, uh, I happen to see uh, the famous Nazarene Jesus, a teacher of wisdom, uh, period. That would be enough to destroy the Christ myth theory. Uh, that would be, I mean, unless you could find out that it was some sort of a hoax, which just seemed, you know, uh, unless something like that were involved, uh, that would be it, because uh, the absence of uh, evidence isn't necessarily evidence for absence. Sometimes it is, but uh, it, it may be just a uh, just a coincidence that there is no surviving attestation of Jesus if he existed but were not the Superman described in the Gospels, and that's what most critical uh, Jesus scholars think, you wouldn't necessarily expect him to be mentioned by historians of the time any more than you would expect an American history textbook to have a section on Oral Roberts. There were these healers and exorcists were a dime a dozen back then. Uh, so that's never uh, bothered me much, but there are a couple of things that really make me think you, you've got to wrestle with these, and I don't think people do. One is the likelihood that virtually every story of Jesus in the Gospels makes a lot of sense if it were a rewrite of, the, of this or that Old Testament story from the Greek Septuagint, the uh, Greek translation of uh, the Old Testament. Uh, again and again, uh, many scholars have shown that this or that story of Elijah or Elisha, David, Moses, Joshua, etc., uh, has been, uh, is so close, sometimes even verbatim, to gospel stories, or if they're not, it's pretty easy to see that they have the same elements that may simply have been reshuffled, a common technique in uh, literature of the day, people rewriting the Odyssey and so on. Uh, well, it's not that there is such a thing here and there, but virtually everything reads quite plausibly, miracle or not, uh, as if it were rewritten from the uh, the Old Testament in Greek. Uh, and, and what little doesn't look suspiciously like material from the Iliad or the Odyssey, as Den Dennis MacDonald has shown pretty persuasively. So right there, I wonder why is there nothing left over? Why is there nothing like there is with other deified historical figures like Caesar Augustus? Why is there no leftover secular biographical information? Uh, it's all uh, th this kind of thing. And uh, that's, uh, uh, and, and even if you say, well, wait a minute, there are places where Jesus, the figure of Jesus touches contemporary history, even if there aren't 
extra biblical historians who mention him, and I think there are not, uh, the story involves Herod Antipas, Herod the Great, Pontius Pilate, Caiaphas, and so forth. Well, ancient novels had, uh, well, even modern historical novels have known people in it to give it some sort of uh, historical color, you might say. And uh, the fact that there, that each one of these intersections has been challenged long ago by people that had no idea of the Christ myth. People that said, well, look, the trial before Caiaphas, it, it, uh, it takes place on Passover Eve. Uh, who's the transgressor here? It's, it's as, as if the writer of the story just didn't quite realize the bind he was getting himself into. The, the uh, verdict on Jesus of blasphemy because he says he's God's son, this kind of reflects much later Jewish Christian debate. Uh, it's not clear from anything of the story up to that point that that would have been the issue if there was a trial. So did that ever happen? Uh, uh, the, uh, the thing with Herod the Great trying to kill uh, the infant Jesus in Bethlehem, this looks so much like a similar story from Josephus of Pharaoh learning about Moses' birth and trying to eradicate him but failing. And uh, it's so on down the line, it's there's no real connection as you do have with Caesar Augustus, right? He is so inextricably interwoven into the history of the day that there's no chance. You, you couldn't bracket him off as a legend. You, you'd have a heck of a gap to fill. So uh, Jesus floats free of history, it seems to me. And, um, and uh, there doesn't seem to be any uh, neutral biographical information about him. Everything we read either comes out of the Old Testament or also uh, fits the mythic hero archetype, a repeating outline of uh, that you find uh, bits and pieces of in heroes all over the world, Krishna, Oedipus, the Buddha, uh, Augustus, Cyrus of Persia, and so on and so on, where you have a, a Annunciation by a god or an angel, a birth by a means of a, uh, a miraculous conception of one sort or another, a child prodigy episode. Uh, he knows more than the adults and such. Uh, the, uh, the the variety of healings and exorcisms. Uh, there's loads of those with uh, Apollonius of Tyana that seem very similar. For instance, uh, the acclamation of the crowd, but the crowd then turns on the hero. He's crowned king king, literally or fictively, Jesus is sort of both uh, in, in the uh, story, uh, but that eventually, uh, or quickly, they turn on him and then he's put to death frequently on a hilltop and then his, uh, his burial place is unknown or their rival claimants to it. Then he appears either before or after an ascension and tells his disciples or the citizens of Rome or whoever to keep up the good work and so on. Isn't it odd that the story of Jesus fits this perfectly? In fact, it's the best example of the of mythic hero story. And there's nothing left over. Uh, that seems uh, very suspicious to me. Uh, the existence in the Pauline epistles of uh, apparently a non-historical Jesus. Th there are certain things that seem on other grounds to be interpolated into the, the texts, but uh, there is nothing about Jesus as a teacher or a, or a healer, no statement about doing miracles. Uh, you have the crucifixion, uh, the resurrection, which seems to be kind of the same thing as the ascension, uh, not yet distinguished, and the notion that God sent forth his son uh, and then he yielded him up. That's the word uh, that uh, can be translated as betrayal, and somebody, I think, mistranslated it and then came up with a Judas thing because of that, but it really implied God just handed him over to death for our sake, and that he was crucified by whom? Well, uh, the epistles don't say anything about uh, Pontius Pilate. Uh, First Timothy does, but that's a later pseudepigraph. Um, it says that he was put to death apparently in the heavenly spheres where the archons, the principalities and powers reside. Uh, they, they didn't depict the, these angels or Satan as on the earth. Uh, they were in the, the lower heavens, a concentric series. And if they put Jesus to death and nothing is said about historical or political circumstances, you really do have to ask if like uh, Purusha or some of these other gods, he was killed, quote unquote, uh, in, in 
Athens, what we would call space. Uh, the Gnostic myth uh, has that. The, the evil archons uh, destroyed and shredded the man of light and so on. Not in some alley somewhere, but in the, up in, uh, in, in heaven. Uh, so how did that ever come about if, there, if it came from a historical Jesus? That, that seems, why would you just eclipse the character? It's one thing to suggest a historical person was eventually deified, a personality cult, but to have a, a version of the story that simply effaces or ignores any or even implicitly denies any historical existence, that's really odd. It seems much more likely that uh, you have originally a savior god uh, who gets historicized, and it's easy to see why. For one thing, Herodotus and others used to look back at Greek mythology, and they were what's called euhamerists, because euhamerists had come up with a theory that the, the various gods were really historical figures that had been lionized and mythologized, so that Hercules was a strong man, a warrior who gets made into a god. Asclepius, the healing god, was, he was like the... Uh, the uh, uh, Marcus Welby of his day. He was a great physician and uh, so they, uh, they eventually magnified him into a god and so on. The, Ares, the war god, was some famous general and they, they had no evidence of this. They just assumed it because they had the idea one often hears in Hammer films that uh, all these myths usually have a base in, basis in fact. Eh, no, they don't. But that's what these Greeks thought. and. I think that that's what happened with Jesus and uh, that he was a, a mythical entity who was brought down to earth for a particular reason. There were many different types of early Christianity who um, had something to do with some Jesus or Christ, maybe not even the same one, and Gnostics and others, and they got their so-called information about Jesus from dreams and revelations. And uh, given the fact that they didn't even agree, you know, how could you possibly arbitrate these claims? And so some of them began to say, well, all right, uh, dream, uh, division on the Damascus Road, Okay, that doesn't count for much, but I uh, suppose our founders were trained by guys who were uh, d the disciples of a historical founder, Jesus of Nazareth. Well, then we've got to shake the hand that shook the hand. You can come up with anything you want in Jesus' name, but we, uh, our guys heard it from the, the Savior's mouth. And uh, th that's one reason why there were, I think, different estimates uh, about where Jesus l should be placed in history. They kept updating him so there'd be less time between the current bunch of bishops and the apostles. So Jesus gets later in history. Irenaeus thought he was killed and Jesus was executed in the reign of Claudius Caesar, though uh, in the Gospels it's Tiberius Caesar. And in uh, Jewish sources it was under Alexander Janius a hundred years earlier. Uh, that, uh, it seems to me, yeah, like Herodotus again said Hercules, based on this detail of the myth, he must have lived in the reign of King so-and-so, but come to think of it, uh, if this one uh, tells us anything, he must have been in so-and-so's reign. Ah, eh, well, I don't know, he lived back there sometime. To me, that's what it looks like. And uh, so it seems, that I think, like that the evidence supports the Christ myth theory. And one last thing, the notion of the dying and rising gods, of course this is like a subset of the mythic hero archetype, but there were a number of salvation religions that involved the initiate going through a ritual that united him with the divine savior and the savior's victory over death and so that you would share it, you would sort of become part of him and you would have immortality. Mithras, Hercules, uh, Osiris, uh, Tammuz, Attis, Adonis and so on. Well, um, uh, this is so much like not only the story but the ritual application of the story in Christian baptism that uh, I, I got to think, why think one of these is historical and the other is not? Now the answer of apologists has long been, uh, well, uh, maybe uh, the pagans borrowed it from Christianity. They saw it was selling real well and decided to build that into their gospel too. The problem with that is uh, we have evidence of, of 
pre-Christian, non-Christian versions of this that go back hundreds of years, Baal and Osiris and so forth. Uh, and, and even if we didn't, the early Christians who tried to deal with this, like Tertullian and Justin Martyr, when pagans would say, well, this is just the same old thing we've heard before, they say, well, you know why that is, don't you? Uh, Satan knew that Jesus was going to come and to throw everybody off the track, he planted these fake stories, counterfeits, in advance so that the people like you would laugh it off. Uh, ask yourself, who would mount such an argument if they knew that the Christian version was the earliest? I mean, if there was any chance that you knew the Mithraeus or somebody had ripped this off, you would never argue that Satan had counterfeited the story in advance. You're admitting these stories are pre-Christian. It's, it's one of the things from, from some of the apologists. So that there are things that, that apologists have talked about that I'll get to that I, I think are far more compelling, but the idea of, of foreshadowing it, as if Satan could come in and foreshadow these uh, myths and God didn't see that happen and then change the story? I mean, because certainly you, you would think that you could change the story enough to, or provide better evidence to show that this one is not a myth. Mm. But it's, it, seem, it seems almost like a, yes, Satan came along and foiled God's plan by making it seem even more ridiculous and God did nothing about it. Or if God purposely uh, refrained from debunking uh, the resurrection of Attis or something like that, what could he possibly have had in mind? Did he want uh, people to have to make a faith decision without any evidence? So uh, as if there is something meritorious in a blind leap of faith? Is it salvation by gullibility? I mean, that, that raises a worse problem. Uh, so uh, it just doesn't work, I don't think. So you mentioned the apostles in the perhaps intentional or otherwise, an attempt to tie this back to the shake the hand that shook the hand. Mm. And I think that, it, it, to me, it's kind of telling that one of the strongest uh, arguments for historicity from the apologists, and even um, Bart Ehrman and others, mm. is the testimony of the apostles. So they begin with this assumption that, that those, are, those were definitely real people. We have some writings from some of them purportedly. And so by tying it to them, that somehow makes the story more true. And this is this, I guess, seems compelling, probably far more so than Satan foreshadowing the mm. stories. Um, but it puts us in the position that you started with, which is we can't, it's, it, because, it seems clear that we can't definitively say either way. Mm -hmm. Isn't the inability to demonstrate the historicity of Jesus already damning to Christianity, at least in its modern form, that's tied to the existence and the sacrifice of, of the individual? Well, of course, no Christian apologist or believer would say there is any real chance that Jesus might not have existed. And I think, I mean, I can't read anybody's mind, but it seems to me they just cannot think outside of that box. It's just too threatening. And uh, so it's, it's no surprise. Now, Bart Ehrman is not a Christian believer. He's at least an, an agnostic, I think more likely a, a, an atheist, but he's still part of that magisterium, as I like to call it, of mainstream scholarship, or what I call the uh, the stuck in the middle with you brand of scholarship that, uh, okay, you know, let's have a bell curve and stay safely within the, the, the mainstream there where everybody has uh, critical but conservative views, uh, not these nutty William Lane Craig types or these, these lunatic mythicists, uh, and it's almost just a statistical thing. We, the truth must lie somewhere in the middle. Well, that, that's very easy to say depending on how you construct the curve or how you slice the pie. Don't they have a, a flaw like in the methodology? Because I've been, my understanding was that the general assumption for proper historians is to assume that someone existed if they're presented as a real person until such time as it's demonstrated that they didn't exist. So it seems like a shifting of the burden of proof, perhaps out of necessity of the inability to properly explore history. Well, uh, if you it's a question of does something smell fishy? Is there something odd? Is there some initial reason to doubt it? Uh, and, and I think with a, a kind of Superman character, like if, if you look at it, Superman comics or TV, it's conceivable there's such a person. Uh, like the uh, movie Galaxy Quest where these aliens had seen the Star Trek episodes and thought they were historical documentaries. It's possible, but uh, it, it seems so 
far-fetched. You'd have to raise all these questions. And in general, as, uh, uh, oh, what's his name that uh, wrote the, uh, Collingwood uh, wrote the idea of history. He says that it's a kind of an ancient and medieval style of historiography to regard the, the beliefs of the past and documents of the past as authorities, as they used to say. Well, our authorities say uh, that changed when historians came gen became genuinely critical and said, no, they're not authorities, they're sources. And it's up to us to uh, put their feet to the fire and determine if there is any reason to believe them because narratives are written for an awful lot of reasons. Without trying to get into politics, I, I think that uh, that political discourse in our time has descended to such a low state that my initial assumption when I hear administration spokespeople is that it's a lie because so much of what they say about everything turns out to be spin to the point of deception and it's later shown to be I would have to have some kind of independent corroboration or they might be telling the truth but there is simply no reason to think so that's sort of an extreme case but Collingwood said uh, that all sources are useful for history writing because there is a history of propaganda to be written. Uh, in my uh, view, in this case, it would be like uh, uh, how did the uh, doctrine of Jesus evolve? That's a different thing from uh, what was the historical Jesus. So it's, it's useful, but you have to decide for what. And so you, you never really just start out accepting what a source tells you, uh, you especially if there are only four of them and they're uh, all obviously um, overtly propaganda for a, a religion full of miracles. You don't assume that there was a miracle working Gautama Buddha. Uh, and nobody assumes that except Buddhist believers, and it's the same thing here. And. Uh, and then you, you get into, well, okay, suppose there was a non-miraculous Jesus. Uh, good luck. I mean, that, that could well be, but I know very well the kind of delicate surgery uh, that goes into trying to construct a historical Jesus, and it's kind of like the old game operation. you got to be pretty uh, careful, because if you hit the edge, you know, zap, and the patient's dead. Uh, the same way, it's so subjective, because the evidence points in so many different directions that all all kinds of, uh, like C.S. Lewis says in the Screw Tape Letters, there's a new flock of historical Jesus books out uh, on every publisher's spring list. Yeah, that is even more true than in his day. And he sort of had a point. Uh, he says the texts say what they say and they can't be made to say something else. Well, yes, they can, but why? Because the uh, the texts speak of a hist uh, of a of a miracle working Superman and uh, to say, well, no, they don't. They, if you can find him, there's a historical character who was a revolutionist or a Galilean pietist or a feminist or this or that. You got to do, a, you got to cut out a whole lot of it and it just, it's no coincidence that people seem to create a Jesus in their own image, which means he's just becoming, he's evolving into yet more mythic Jesuses. Uh, so you can't start out with that assumption. It's nowhere near that simple. So given the complexities of this and the fact that we can't get to a resolution, we can say what seems to be most reasonable at any given time, uh, in conversations between atheists and Christians, uh, whether it's in a formal debate or you know a family structure, does this topic is this topic even relevant? I mean, is this something that we should perhaps be presenting to maybe instill some doubt, or is this so nebulous that you know it's probably better to not focus on it? I don't know. Well, I do suspect, like I only debate this when this is the topic of debate as if it's just an interesting issue uh, because it gets to be so complex that you're, you're really raising a lost continent and exploring it with somebody and y your assumptions if you take any sort of critical approach are so different from those of a believer that y you uh, you have to go back and back and back to, to prepare the ground and I don't think there's time for that and it's going to be confusing. It, it would seem to me to be a better approach to raise questions about how coherent Christian beliefs are uh, like the, the atonement 
What do you have in mind when you say that the death of Jesus, even if he's God incarnate, somehow avails to get rid of your moral guilt? Like, how, how does it do it? Do, do you even have anything in mind, or is it just a kind of a slogan? And I think it is. Or what do you mean by having a personal relationship with Christ? Uh, do you hear voices, or, or, or what? Do you just read the Bible, and, and what you learn from it, you kind of think Jesus sent you? Often I think that's what they mean, which ain't much. It doesn't justify the, the language. It's much overblown. Or uh, do you just have an imaginary friend? I mean, how is your experience of knowing Jesus different from having an imaginary friend as a kid? And this isn't ridicule. It's just, can you describe to me what it is? And, and if you can't go beyond that, why should you think it is any more than having an imaginary friend? And furthermore, how is Jesus available after 2,000 years to have a chat with millions of Christians at the same time. It's like Santa Claus going down the chimneys of millions of homes in half a day. Uh, that's not a joke. Uh, you've got to ask that question. Are you saying that Jesus isn't really Jesus anymore? He's sort of vaguely some spiritual radiance because uh, you might and that might make sense, but not if you want to name it Jesus. So why don't you talk about having a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit? I'm not sure if that would make any more sense, but at least it wouldn't be absurd like this is. Have you ever thought what is entailed about this? Uh, what is there about a warm devotional feeling that marks it as Jesus of Nazareth? Because I don't, I don't think people have ever explored any of these things on a popular level. And so that's what I would, oh yeah, one other thing. I would suggest uh, you ask them, ask yourself if the message has really paid off for you. Do you constantly live in peace that passes understanding? Do you really have a victorious life? Uh, are, are things so much better now and, and so on? Or is it just that you're in a peer group that may be a little more wholesome than others you could be, but is there anything that really justifies your rhetoric? And uh, I mean, you decide for yourself uh, in a, if you can like be Socratic and not uh, try to argue a point with them, but say, look, these are questions I have. If you can answer them, that's fine, but I suggest you think about them. They, they, the ball's in their court. I, uh, there's less to defend in that sense. You're not exactly attacking. So one of the things about kind of the modern religions and their pervasiveness is you've got a collection of apologists who have dealt with some of those questions, and while I don't think they've come, they don't definitely haven't come up with answers that would satisfy me, uh, even though once upon a time they did. I was yeah, me too. Twenty-five years as a fundamentalist, mm. I, I, I got to a point where I either saw through it, not necessarily trying to be insulting or mm -hmm. whatever, but. I don't see any reason to think that it's real. So while I'm happy to talk doctrine with people, I, I tend to get more involved in, in like the classical arguments for the existence of God. Does mm -hmm. the world make sense given, you know, how did you reach these? But I, I like the approach of, uh, of that. When you get to apologists, it'll be like, oh, the peace that passes understanding. Well, that's not for this life, that's for the next life. And so it's, it's any, there's a loophole for everything. That I never heard, that particular dodge. Well, That's interesting. It, it, the Gospels will say that, you know, you, you'll be persecuted in my name's sake, and so this, this life is about trial, and Satan is the adversary. And I think, you know, I've written about the, the uh, Sermon on the Mount, and because uh, I've even heard atheists laud it as, oh, this is, you know, wisdom mm. beyond, and it's just so beautiful. And so I, I went through verse by verse and pointed out what was good advice, what was bad advice. Mm. And there are passages in there that I think specifically encourage uh, victimhood mentality in mm. Christianity. Mm. And so like, if you're, if you're preaching Jesus and people are persecuting or mocking or you're, you're not in tune with the world, not only is that not a bad thing, it's a good thing. You know, that you'll be persecuted for my name. Uh, you've got an adversary out there for you. And what it does, is, so if somebody, if you're preaching to somebody and they think, oh, well, you're just a dick, well, that could be Satan challenging you because you are, in fact, right with God, or it could be that you are a dick, that you're being obnoxious mm. to people, and how do you tell the difference? And they just seem to say, ah, well, this is what the Bible says, and, you know, I will have, I, it's, it's the next life where this reward, where this peace is in their mind. And, and if you can keep pushing that off, is there anything you can't justify? Yeah, plus the fact that the idea that you can 
get divine guidance and so forth, uh, that uh, yeah, I, I can discern and I must discern the will of God, uh, that's, uh, that's a never-ending cycle because you come up with something you are sure is God's plan because you're told you have certainty available, you can discern God's will, and then it uh, blows up in your face and you say, you know, it was foolish of me, presumptuous of me to think I could uh, discern the will of God, I'm just a mortal. Not a bad conclusion, but then that's just a way to explain away the failure, you're going to keep right on seeking the will of God and thinking you found it. Uh, or there's the, the bait and switch of answered prayer. Well, God did answer prayer, but he said no. Uh, that's not what you thought, and it, it's not what you're going to think next time either. Uh, if, if it's if I will be done, like Meister Eckhart said, why don't you just leave it at that, rather than thinking you can tell God his business. Um, so what is it they expect out of this? I think the whole thing comes down to a non-falsifiable gas bag. Uh, and uh, ultimately, and I remember thinking this as an evangelical, that the thing, all things work together for good for those who love God, that sounds strikingly like ancient Stoicism, as indeed a lot of the epistle material does. The Stoics said that uh, the divine will is always done because they viewed Zeus uh, pantheistically. He's the logos that permeates everything, and so what you need to do is to realize that everything happens to you for a purpose, uh, to make you more virtuous, and nothing else really matters. So you can't lose anything that uh, that is really valuable, and everything, every trial and tribulation, every suffering, uh, it is like a, the chisel trying to, to perfect the shape of the right. diamond, and they often use that analogy. But what that means is you can't really say God is going to protect me. I, I, if God be for me, who can be against me and all that? You, you're just, uh, you just have to say, well, whatever happens, like it or not, it's for my good because God says so. That may be a noble way of dealing with life, but that's not what they start out telling you, that, that God will send in the cavalry and so on. So there, it's bait and switch. What are you actually thinking is going to happen? And I think there's no coherent idea either about what the beliefs mean or, or what they're worth in practice. So jumping back for a second yeah, to the mythicist position, we talked a little bit about historians and potential flaws in their default assumptions mm -hmm. about, uh, but also when it comes to the mythicists, my take on this after uh, talking with others is that there are several different camps mm -hmm. and that there are some that are saying, oh, you know, hey, we shouldn't just assume that he existed. As a matter of fact, we may have good reason to think that this is a myth and there are these elements. Mm -hmm. um, then there are others that say, well, we're almost, you know, it's far more likely that this is myth than real. And then there seems to be in another group that might go a step further to assert that, well, of course this is myth and this is was like intentionally constructed mm -hmm. as a conspiracy. And some have even gone to the point where it's, uh, where they see an obviously constructed joke that only the intellectual elite are supposed to discover, like... A Joseph Atwill? It's kind of like that. So with all these different camps, it, it seems to me that, or slightly different positions, um, when the bulk, I suppose, of modern historians want to write off the mythicists, mm -hmm. uh, this is just a fringe thing, it's not taken seriously by anybody, um, are, they, are they writing off the fringe, are they writing off all of them based on fringe ideas that may be, you know, too conspiracy theory minded, um, or have they actually bothered to, to recognize that there are subtle differences between these and that maybe you shouldn't write off anybody who identifies as a mythicist just because of what one person said. I think uh, they do write off everybody and just mash it all together as mythicism and the, well, it's kind of like we heard in a lecture earlier today, there are these horror stories of crazy Christians denying their children a needful medicine because Dr. Jesus will heal them or, or uh, beating them because they think they have a demon in them. 
What is the point of rehearsing that? Is that supposed to be the way it usually is with Christians? It's ludicrous. Uh, that, that's absurd. Uh, and uh, I mean, these people are nuts. Who doesn't think so? Uh, but if you can make people think, oh yeah, that's the way Christians are. You got an easy victory in your own mind. And I think it's the same thing here. There are some nutty views uh, about uh, the Jesus as a myth uh, that are poorly argued and uh, very far-fetched. And uh, I, uh, in fact, I have a book uh, called uh, The Historical Bejesus, where I go into various uh, recent lives of Jesus, and I have a section on the Catholic historical Jesus books, Jewish ones, and, and then I have uh, mythicists, and I have several of them where I say I think their method is is invalid and the results are not convincing, and some you know, big name scholars, and I said, however, here's the problem. I don't think it stands and falls as one, and uh, if you want to be specific, good, criticize them. But I noticed in Bart Ehrman's book, Did Jesus Exist? and uh, 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 Morris Evans's uh, book on Jesus, I forget the title, they're all pretty similar. It, it was pretty clear they wanted to demean these people like Earl Doherty, he just doesn't have a degree. I, you can't mean to say that, just read his book. Uh, I mean, I don't care if it was composed by a room full of monkeys randomly pecking at typewriters. Uh, it, it doesn't matter what, you got to evaluate the arguments. Uh, oh, uh, he had to get it published himself. Oh, you mean like David Hume? Uh, that then validates it. Uh, and, uh, but there's several of them. I mean, it's so different. You really have to start making distinctions, but uh, they just don't. In fact, uh, um, uh, Casey, would refer to people as blogger so-and-so to, to try to marginalize them and say, well, they're just cranks living in their parents' basements and all this. That's just, or the appeal to authority. Uh, I'm afraid Bart Ehrman does that quite a bit. Well, most scholars think, look, most scholars thought Jesus should be executed, right? The Sanhedrin, they all voted unanimously. This guy's a false prophet. That doesn't mean a thing. Most people used to think that the earth was flat. Uh, were they right? until uh, somebody showed it wasn't. It, it's absurd, and I, it seems to me no one resorts to this kind of thing unless they're trying to uh, find the uh, escape door quick. And uh, this is surprising. Well, uh, Ehrman, I, I really respect him a lot. I hate to sound like I'm running him down, but since it, it came up, like, he... A lot of his readers were amazed that here he is saying what good source material we have to establish Jesus as a historical figure, when in all of his other books, he said, you can't trust any of this stuff. Uh, yeah, so, uh, and uh, it's, it, it, I think the, uh, a good book against the Christ myth theory has yet to be written, not that there couldn't be one. Uh, and these specifics, like why is Jesus never quoted in the epistles? Uh, if if he, his teaching was around in the Gospels or an oral tradition, surely if you had some relevant quote, that would settle the issue, wouldn't it? But instead, no, we've got all kinds of weird arguments and appeals to prophecies and so on. Well, James D. G. Dunn, a great New Testament scholar, he said, oh, well, uh, you see, they knew Jesus had said that and that their readers would know Jesus had said it. And uh, so they were just saying, you know, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, uh, say no more, that that would be more effective. <laughs> Get out of here. How can you say that with a straight face? And yet they all do. It's just amazing. Don't you have some decent argument? I mean, I'm sure you must. Let's hear. I can think of a couple of decent arguments against the Christ myth theory, but uh, it's, it's amazingly poor. Maybe Bart and I may be sharing a stage to talk about this, and I think then we can really get down to some business. That, that should be a fun, constructive thing. So setting aside the mythicism, we'll get to, to kind of one last question. So this is primarily about teaching people how to have better conversations, whether it's in a formal debate, whether it's talking to your family and friends, mm. you know, and, and we, we cover a wide range of things. Outside of mythicism, is, do you have, in conversations with theists, I don't know necessarily if you even have the goal of perhaps convincing them that they might be wrong or that they haven't given a good mm. reason, is there one argument or one area, apart from what you've already talked about, 
that you would encourage people to do and or, or, uh, an argument that you would encourage them to present and perhaps a way of thinking about the process and just like general advice for having the conversations? Well, uh, I don't make it my business to try to deconvert anybody to, to or from anything. I feel like it's none of my business, and if I start doing that, I'm just a witnessing uh, evangelist for something else, and I don't want any part of that. I don't want to just switch teams. I want to get out of the stadium. Uh, but uh, I do think that in any of these discussions, the thing to do is not to attack them with a sales pitch or, or here's why your belief is wrong and you should accept what I'm saying. If that's not the way to approach anybody, like even in debates on apologetics and the like, I'll say, uh, I found I was an evangelical apologist. I'm not anymore because I found the arguments disappointing. They they stopped sounding good to me. I couldn't use them to try to convince anyone. Let me tell you why that is. You decide whether you think they're convincing or not, but perhaps you haven't thought of it this way, and I just want to stimulate thought. Do with it what you will. That's a little tough not to take seriously. Whereas if they say, no, you've got to drop that crazy belief, Oh yeah, uh, but if you say, "Look, I do what you want," but in case you're interested, here's how I came not to accept this anymore. Maybe you'll have better luck than I will. If they're if it's non-threatening, they kind of have to think about it. This video is made possible by supporters of the Atheist Debates Patreon project. You can find more information and add your support at patreoncom Debates.